Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And if you would, turn around and look at the camera and wave to Jay. Say, hi, Jay. Hi, Jay. Thank you very much. I don't know. He's, he's invisible today, but hopefully this camera will keep going and we can record today's service, okay? So, thank you, everybody. I tell you. I know we have some guests here today who have not been with us before, so I want to just share with you that um, Florence, we reside on the native land of the Sayusla Indians in the Sayusla River Valley. So we want to make sure that we honor them and make sure that we are sharing how grateful we are for their stewardship of this land. We appreciate it and uh, sending all of our love to that tribe and thanks to the past, present, and future generations for what they've given us. Good morning and welcome to FOOF. My name is Sally Watts. It's a pleasure to see you all here today. And uh, if you would, we always start our service by singing Spirit of Life. It is number 123 in your hymnal. If you'd like to open that up and sing along, that would be great. Jeff's going to lead this. And uh, yeah, Spirit of Life, number 123. Words are on the back of the program. If you know. Celebrating his birthday. 
Jim Negri's got a birthday coming up, Carol Lorraine, Paula Harrison, April Dumas, Jeff Lovejoy is down the road here, David Dumas and Sarah Bauer. So, anybody else have a birthday here in, in March that we might have forgotten? Let me know and we'll add you to the list. Okay. Also today, uh, starting at 1 o'clock at the Senior Center, I trust you all know where the Florence Senior Center is off Kingwood. Um, we've got our annual retreat, we're calling it Renew and Reconnect, and we're going to spend a few hours together and talk about our future. Ruth Miller will lead us through this process where we get to talk about what we got, what we want, and how we're going to do it. Okay? So we invite everybody to be there today at 1 o'clock, and uh, we'll still have the mask mandate, like refreshments and beverage will be available during break time. Okay? So hope to see you there at 1 o'clock. Right? Yes. Good. Good, good, good. Question. Yes. Do you have to actually be a paid member or can you be just one of the members? This is open to anybody. Open to anybody. But we all know, I think, I mean, if you're a member, you know, an honest member here, honest, like is a dishonest member? <laughs> <laughs> if you're a member, and you know you're a member, if you look down at your badge and it's got a yellow or a colored uh, logo, that means you're a member. You're, you've, you've paid your time, talent, and treasure, and you've uh, given a, a, a pledge of support. Friends are welcome. If you're not a member, please come. Hear what the plans are. We're not shutting the door on anybody. Show up. Be there. Help guide us to the future, okay? And maybe you'll want to join. Them. So does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. So, following the service today, Catherine, do you want to stick around for a few minutes and do any sort of affirmative prayer? Mm -hmm. Good, good. Unfortunately, Dennis Reynolds, our guest today, Reverend Dennis, will not be available to do a dialogue circle. He has another obligation. But uh, if you get to him quickly, you might be able to get one of your questions answered, okay? But we won't be doing a formal dialogue circle. And then we ask you to remain masked at all times, and when I forget, remind me, unless you're behind here. And then uh, water only up here and no beverage out there. Make sense? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, one other announcement real quick I have. that If you look down on the floor, you may see some blue tape on the floor. That's because the Last Resort Players has been rehearsing here uh, in the evenings for the last month or so. And that's their stage. So they come in in the evenings and they rehearse here. And the production they're putting on is a production called John and Jen. And it's a jewel box musical about brother and sister and mother and son. So they go through a 40-year generational swing. Um, and this is a really cool production. So I invite you to get your tickets early and enjoy this particular production and help support Last Resort players. Ray? I have an announcement. Yes. And I know Mark has an announcement too. So uh, on. Habitat for Humanity has created what they're calling a tool trailer, which people can use for their yards. and. They're looking for a demonstration yard, somebody who needs help beautifying their yard in Florence to unveil this thing, and they're going to be unveiling it, I think, March 12th. So if you know somebody whose yard needs some TLC... Does that mean you can point your finger at your neighbor that says, that neighbor <laughs> really needs help? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but seriously, if you know somebody who can't you know, physically do it or needs help, yeah. They're going to have a crew come in and like beautify their yard with this tool. Very thing. nice. So let me know. When I, there's a little application you got to fill out. My habitat will pick who gets to do it. Thank you, Ray. Wow. And also in the e-blast, I think we put something in there announcing this new arrival from Habitat. They're really expanding the services that they give. So this is another wonderful thing that our local Habitat for Humanity is up to. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Mark, you've got an announcement. Okay, so I have good news and I have good news. <laughs> Which do you want to hear first? <laughs> good news. We're confirmed for the uh, interfaith uh, invocation on climate change for April 3rd, Sunday, uh, 2 to 5, and it'll be at the New Life Lutheran Church. That's the one behind Grocery Outlet. Everybody knows where that is. And, um, I've got uh, speakers, I've got about 10 speakers lined up from the different churches and uh, spiritual groups in Florence. So it should be very, interest, be very interesting hearing everyone's uh, approach from their own faith and belief system. That's April 3rd. 
Uh, and then on April 22nd, we're organizing a climate change super strike. Uh, it happens to be on a Friday, Earth Day. And uh, it's, did I mention it was Earth Day? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Earth Day. And um, uh, we need some people to help organize that. So I wanted to pass this around and anyone who's interested can uh, give us your contact information and we'll get back to you and let you know what's needed. So, so you'll put something in for us, we can put that in the newsletter, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. going to have a flyer hopefully okay. by next Sunday. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, you'll notice on the back table, <clears throat> well, I'll do this in Joey's concerns, never mind. So, yeah, shall we light the chalice? We shall. We shall. Uh, I'll light it. You want to, why don't you hand me the, the handheld? You can stand back here. Over here. Yeah, you can stand back here. Everybody. We'll get our choreography. We've got the choreography. We'll work in it. We'll work in it. Our chalice lighting this morning is from the Canadian Unitarian Minister, Reverend Deborah Falk. A chalice in our midst is the symbol of our religious faith. A faith built on the foundations of freedom, reason, and welcome. A faith sustained by acts of kindness and justice. A faith that envisions a world flourishing with equality for all people. A faith that demands the living out of goodness. Ooh, a faith that requires thoughtfulness. A faith of wholeness. This tiny flame is the symbol of the spirit of the spark of all within each of us. Blessed be. I invite Catherine to come forward for our joys and concerns. Good morning, everyone. This is the part of our ceremony for joys and concerns where we share ourselves with each other, with our community. Whatever is going on with you that seems important, that seems like we just need to say it. I was reading something this morning in this book I'm really enjoying, Radical Hope. It's about healing. And um, one of the biggest flaws in modern society is how the notion, I can do it on my own, is revered. While independence is an important human trait, we need to remember that humans are social creatures who have survived over millennia together living in groups whose members depended on one another for survival, health, and happiness. So most of you know how to do this. Those of you who don't, we line up over around here. Sally hands you the microphone. You drop the shell in the cleansing water after what you share. Coming the wrong way, but Santa's coming the wrong direction, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's how I am, you know. I know. <laughs> so come on over here. Okay. All right, this shell is for um, me, and uh, it takes a lot for me to get up here, okay? But, um, you know, sometime back... <laughs> don't touch me all the time! Don't touch me all the time! <laughs> sometime back, I announced that I was going to be out for a while because I was having a knee replacement. Well, some of you may be wondering, whatever happened to that whole knee replacement thing? Well, it got postponed for the second time because I had an oral surgery and they found cancer. Mm -hmm. And so that just put me in a tailspin and knee surgery was off and I had to go through all this diagnosis stuff. And um, so I just completed a PET scan last week and it's only a little bit of cancer, okay? <laughs> It's only a little bit in there. I can't find it all in my body. It's, it's you know. Isolated. Isolated, I think. It's hard to get a straight answer sometimes out of doctors. But anyway, I will be exploring some treatments um, that I feel are suitable for this body. Um, what they're proposing is 
something that I thought of a good analogy, and all I could think of was they want to use a um, fire extinguisher to put out a candle. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not willing to go there yet. I will if I have to, but not yet. So anyway, when you picture me, just picture me in complete, total health throughout my body. It's so much better than I anticipated. You know, when you say the word cancer, you know, everybody just goes into fear mode. And I also want to say that this lady here has been on my side the whole time. Could have picked a better care committee person, but way beyond that, I couldn't have found a better friend yeah. to help me through this process. And I just have to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you know, support is what we all are here for for each other. And I just so so appreciate it, along with my ladies group, power of aid group, powerful, caring loving group of women. Men are invited too, you know, but this <laughs> just happens to be all women. I am so, so grateful for this church and for everything that's provided here. Thank you. Are you going to show? I already did, but I'm going to drop it down because I talked a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to just share real quickly, uh, our friend Paula Harrison is still up in, in uh, Portland and will be there for quite a while, or not. Her fiance Gary is passing. He is in hospice. He's at home, and his family has arrived, so it's imminent. And I have brought a couple of cards. Catherine, I took the liberty of just typing up a quick piece Absolutely. of paper. Sure. This one's to Gary. It says, "Your friends at Foof send our love to you with deep appreciation for your being an integral part of our fellowship with your many gifts." Gary was just this Spitfire guy whenever he would show oh. up. He would he climb up and help with the batteries and he and what's what help with the toilet plunger. I mean he just like showed up. <laughs> sweet, sweet Gary, I invite you to just sign your name or add a little something to this letter. And I have one for Paula as well. Mm -hmm. You would take time before you leave today. These will be at the back table. I would really appreciate it. And Paula and Gary will appreciate mm -hmm. it as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna drop two shells. Mm -hmm. One for dear Gary and one for sweet Paula. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh thank you so much. So I have a couple of concerns. Um, Doc Slater, who is the chief of the Sayuslaw tribe, uh, is undergoing chemo. And uh, there's nothing that they want anybody to, you know, uh, contact him or uh, anything to do in particular just to keep him in our thoughts. Um, I learned that he is doing a little bit better as of this week, but uh, that's the situation. Uh, so that's one shell and one concern. The other is for all the people in Ukraine and uh, that thing that's going on that everybody knows to keep that in mind and in your hearts that that will end and that there'll be a decent outcome. Although the war, it's hard to tell decent outcome means, but it's going to go on at least for a little bit longer. So. Thank you. that she'd worked on, done lots of things, to, and she's afraid to stay there. Mm -hmm. 
for fear because he believes and still believes, according to the court, that she was part of the CIA and was going to murder him so he would anticipate that and kill her. So that is a tragedy of this time. It, the paranoia and the cruelty that people justify is really difficult for most of us to deal with. So please mm -hmm. keep Eden and Sophia in your thoughts. And uh, I wouldn't object to a thought of two yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. if I have trouble thinking sometimes. <laughs> So, and I also would thank you because you were a wonderful gift at the time when I was struggling. You were. And I have since found a therapist that does eye movement desensitization reprocessing, and it's been helpful. So, I am enormously grateful for the changes. Thank you. Thank you. I have a little correction from last week. Uh, Sari Hart, I had her scheduled for um, shoulder surgery this week, but uh, the local doctor decided it was more than he could handle. So she's on a waiting list at Slocum. So hopefully very soon this will happen for her shoulder surgery. Okay. Anyone else? One last shout, Sally for all that we don't know about, all that sit at home and just can't quite make it here, all that really are bursting for joy somewhere that, and they're thinking of us and wishing they could be with us, all of it, concerns and absolutely joy. Blessed be. Blessed be. That's wonderful. Thank you. So Jeff, I think you've got an opening hymn. We're going to sing today number 347, and uh, if you'd open your hymnal to 347, Jeff will lead us through this one. It's called Gather the Spirit. We will sing all three verses, and great song, Gather the Spirit, 347, Rise as You Are Able.
forward, and I know we have a, re a reading that we'd like to do. Um, and this is your work, Chi Chi. Thank you. I told Sally this was most appropriate for me to be reading today, mm -hmm. as um, I gather joy. Our reading is from Desmond Tutu, mm -hmm. an Anglican Archbishop and a leader in the struggle for justice and deep peace in South Africa. He died in December. He was a co-author of With the Dalai Lama, of uh, the Book of Joy. Discovering more joy does not save us from the inevitability of hardship and heartbreak. In fact, we may cry more easily. That would be me. But we will laugh more easily, too. Perhaps we are just more alive Yet, as we discover more joy, we can face suffering in a way that ennobles rather than embitters. We have hardship without it becoming hard. We have heartbreaks without being broken. My heart goes out, all our hearts go out to the Ukraine people today. Mm. So true. So true. Thank you for that. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the ones who don't know, Reverend Dennis Reynolds. He comes to us from Eugene, and his wife are here today, and he's got a wonderful message today. What is the title of your message? Our Global Faith. Our Global Faith. What a concept. Dennis, please come forward. As a, an aside, I just, you know, really appreciated the selection of, of the hymn um, in terms of the sense of how broad our faith is. Jim Scott, the author of the hymn, used to be a member of the Eugene congregation. And I have to say, every time I hear that song, I can hear Jim's voice singing. Um, and we get those kinds of networks in a relatively small face sometimes. There is more joy somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more joy somewhere. Thus goes the lyrics of another favorite hymn of mine that you'll find in your hymnal. There is more joy somewhere. Somewhere. Is it somewhere over the rainbow? Or was Dorothy spot on when she said, maybe it's right there in your own backyard? You know, in recent years, traveling has been part of my seeking joy. And I know that's not unique for those in my age cohort who have reached that point in time where we have time to travel. And we can find joy in doing so. I've been traveling and been privileged to travel internationally quite a bit, including to a number of countries which I never would have put on my to-go-to list. And it's not always, though, been a global traveler. As a young man, the most extensive and furthest away travel was the year I spent on the Hawaiian island of Maui. Uh, and there I took a kind of sabbatical from political activism that I'd become too engaged in, in what people in Hawaii called here on the Madland. <laughs> that was some 50 years ago. After I returned from Maui, my longest journeys from, were from the Willamette Valley over here to the coast, or where my family had a little house in Walport. Or I would head into the Cascades for hiking, or just some time to be in the woods. When my kids were little, their needs and interests and the simplicity of having a base of operation made trips to the beach house a frequent travel option. Backpacking was for a time replaced with car camping. Now this began to change as my kids and my income grew. My options and my inspirations for travel expanded dramatically when they, one by one, grew up and left home. Concurrently, I began to have work opportunities to travel to conferences and such, and work picked up the tab 
But I would usually add a day or two to my journeys just to be in a different locale. When two of the three kids went to college on the East Coast, Lindsay to Wesleyan University in Connecticut, and Nick to Haverford College, a small Quaker school in Philadelphia, I tried to go East to spend more time with them. Lindsay kept going even further afield, first as an undergraduate and later in graduate school doing research mostly in South Africa, but also in the Republic of Chad. And I have to admit, when I found out she was going there, I had to look on a map to even find out where Chad is. It's south of Liberia. Lindsay's travels inspired and encouraged me to travel more myself, and I began to do so, sometimes simply following her. Since 2009, I've been to South Africa and to Haiti, two countries definitely not on my prior list of possible destinations. The latter trip to Haiti was part of a group of Unitarian Universalist seminary students and who were invited to go as what became a pilot for a program now sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee called the College of Social Justice. There we worked with a peasant collective and I learned much about community and connection and the reality of my incredible economic privilege. On my first trip to South Africa, I stayed with Lindsay and her then partner Thomas, who were both doing doctoral research at the intersection of anthropology and public health. They became my tutors in exploring Zulu culture. My wife Suzanne has become an enthusiastic partner in global travel. Our journeys have included additional trips to South Africa, where Lindsay now resides with her family, and a trip to visit her goddaughter in Argentina when she was studying there. The South African trips have included work to help launch a crash. Crash, that's the South African label for what we would call a preschool. Hmm. I was invited on two trips because I had a prior career in early education with the help of a Zulu translator to offer workshops on neural development for the staff of several crushes. That experience certainly got my neural synapses. In 2019, before traveling to South Africa, we participated in Root and a Habitat for Humanity build in Kabwe, Zambia. My son Nick has also become more of a global citizen. His part, he and his partner Allison and their son Noah live and work in the United Kingdom. He met Allison, who is from South Africa, while traveling in Romania. Now, many of the current generation of young adults have lessons to offer we adult, adult or American, older Americans about what it means to be global citizens, politically and environmentally. And we are all reminded this week in what's happening in Ukraine about that we are global citizens. This past year, our travels have been motivated by our desire to see our two grandchildren. Because of their parents' lives and career decisions, it means we have to travel internationally. Noah, as I said, lives in the United Kingdom most of the time when he's not visiting South Africa. And Jasper, our older grandson, lives in Cape Town. Now, in my various travels, some common repeated things have emerged. Number one, most of the travels are about family. Number two, in addition to being mind-expanding, they often have a service component. Three, we usually bring back souvenirs. Sometimes it's local artwork, or in Suzanne's case, some fabrics. Often, for me, it's shells picked up on a beach, or small stones that I found on a hike. This year, I brought back a small bottle of very special water. Finally, number four, whenever possible in our travels in North America and beyond, we seek out opportunities to connect with other Unitarian Universalists. 
In many countries, though, they simply use the label Unitarians. Such experience, both here in the United States and internationally, expand my appreciation for the multiple ways in which our faith expresses itself, and we have been truly able to find unity in our diversity. What I have seen and heard and felt in churches far afield is that even when we gather in very different looking places and have very different formats and styles of worship, we share many common threads that truly bind us together as siblings in faith. We are partners in our quest for deep meaning and greater joy. While we were in London last November to meet Noah, the youngest grandson, we spent two Sundays, one virtually and one in person, with the members of the new Unitarian Chapel in London. On their webpage, they offer this description. New Unity is a radically inclusive community dedicated to love and justice. We recognize that it's people who have the power and the responsibility to make a better world. We aim to build a fairer and kinder world through an extensive program of non-religious ministry, events, projects, and social justice work. We welcome all people of all backgrounds, sexuality, ages, and abilities, and we nurture a supportive, caring, and welcoming community. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you look like, whomever you love, and however you identify, you're welcome. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. We certainly felt welcome there. We did not get to meet the then, their, then, their minister, Reverend Andy Pakula, who's an American Unitarian Universalist, as he was away on a brief sabbatical leave. It was disappointing as his self description on their webpage labeled a colleague I would very much like to know. Reverend Andy said, I did not take to religion as a young man. Indeed, I was vehemently atheistic and anti-religious. I'm still an atheist. And depending on definitions, I might be called anti-religious. At least, I am anti the kind of religion that fosters homophobia, transphobia, and misogyny, that promotes us via them thinking that insists that it knows the right answer, as if there were just one, that tells us what we should think, believe, and do, and dangle rewards and threatens punishment for us to, be, to get us to behave. He continues, I do not fit the mold, and I don't think any of us are meant to be shaped and manipulated to fit a mold of belief, perspective, sexuality, or ability. We're meant to be treasured as the people we are, to be accepted, loved, and supported as we grow as individuals and join together to create a more just society. Thank you, Reverend Andy. Now, New Unity describes itself as being more like an American Unitarian Universalist congregation than most British Unitarian churches, which are liberal Christian by and large, and they're very, very British, <laughs> which to me means reserved and wedded to tradition. Now, this sense of being reserved is true to some degree of new unity. We experience them as being a bit of classic British cool, pleasant, but certainly not effusive in their manner. We discovered on the second Sunday that Reverend Anthony's not going to be there a whole lot longer. He, when he comes back from a brief sabbatical, he'll just be there until June. And they're in the midst of a ministerial search. And some of the elements of that process, which were addressed in that week's sermon, seem to have much in common with the ministerial search processes of our own Unitarian Universalist Association. When we went to South Africa, which we just returned a few weeks ago, we also went to church, both virtually and in person. 
The Cape Town Unitarians are very different from their English kin. I um, mean, from many of their American cousins in faith, and yet they share many common aspects of a shared faith tradition. Now, this trip was not my first contact with the Cape Town Unitarians. I first visited them back in 2009. Um, I want to share one little piece that came to mind today. When I arrived at their church, they handed out hymns as you entered, and they had the hymns for that day marked. And the first hymn that they were going to sing from what was to them their brand new gray hymnals from the Unitarian Universalist mm -hmm. Association was hymn number one, two, three. Oh. <laughs> Spirit of Life. And the people standing around me looked on in amazement that I did not open the hymnal. Because the Eugene Church, like this church, sang it every Sunday. Yeah. Spirit of Life in Cape Town. You know, one thing I did notice in that church that they tended to look a lot like our churches with not a whole lot of racial diversity, which was surprising, especially in the midst of a city and a country that is only about 20% or less whites. In the after church chatting, I discovered a number of the members were American expats living in South Africa. Several were retirees who were there in part because their retirement funds would go further there. They came to church seeking community. In that longing, they certainly share a common bond with many of us here in the United States. In 2015, I had a different kind of opportunity to connect with Cape Town folk. I discovered back then a Seattle area, through a Seattle area ministers group that the Reverend Rue Milan, then minister of that congregation, was coming to the U.S. to attend General Assembly, which was then also in Portland, Oregon. When we heard that we was going to be in Seattle several days before GA and was seeking a homestay and a ride to Portland, Suzanne and I reached out and invited him to spend a couple of days with us on Whidbey Island, where we were then living, and I was serving as the minister before we would travel together to General Assembly. We had a great visit, spending time talking about theology and church dynamics and the stuff that ministers talk about, as well as we had a chance to give them a glimpse of our natural beauty, and we spent time just hanging out together. When we came to South Africa the next January, we spent our time in KwaZulu-Natal province further north and did not make it to Cape Town. We were back again in 2019, and that year I Ubered into the city for church. The family lives out on the edges of Cape Town. What I saw there was a church that had been changing. It was obviously more diverse racially, and I found out economically. The mood felt much more dynamic and inclusive and joyous than what I had experienced in my earlier visit. Due to family commitments that Sunday, I was unable to linger and learn more about who these people are and what they were up to, but the feeling was upbeat and positive. This year, we got to spend more time with the Cape Town Unitarian. Because they, like many here in the U.S., were not yet meeting in person, our first Sunday, we joined them virtually. On that particular Sunday, Rue Milan, who is no longer their minister, was co-presenting the service. Rue is affiliated with the congregation as a community minister engaged in pastoral care and resiliency work in the larger community. Rue spoke about how he and others in the congregation are supporting the garden project in one of the informal settlements on the edge of Cape Town. South Africa has the largest gap between wealth and poverty of any nation on the planet. And these informal communities are home to some of the poorest and the poor. The goal of the garden project is to not merely meet immediate needs, but to work over time to meet continuing needs and to build supportive and accountable relationships with people in that community. Sounds to me like the best kind of justice work. I pledge to explore how Unitarian Universalists in the U.S. might support projects 
undertaken by Unitarians in Cape Town, and I'm still working on that. On Thursdays, while there, we joined an online meditation led by the congregation's current minister, the Reverend Nima Taylor. That group included folks from around Cape Town, somebody who logged in from Johannesburg, and we discovered one person who was just around the corner from where we were staying. We also had, while there, a delightful lunch in the city with Reverend Nima. She's both an ordained minister who trained at a Unitary Unity Church seminary in Kansas City and a Zen teacher. <coughs> On the following Sunday, we got to go to church in person. There I got my favorite souvenir from this year's journey to Cape Town. It's that small bottle of water I described. You see, we were there for the annual water communion service. They gather together waters many bring and invite all to leave with a bit of those mingled and blessed waters. As is done in many U.S. EU congregations, they begin their church here with such a service. In Cape Town, they hold that service in January. Because here and there, the church here has long been linked to the school year, and their school year and their church year begin in January. It was a sweet, joyful, and meaningful service. Their first in a new hybrid format. Both those present and those joining in virtually participated. I found myself during part of the service weeping softly. The best part of the morning, though, was after the service, when we were invited to stay for tea and biscuits, or as we would call them in the U.S., cookies. The cookies were mediocre, but the accompanying conversations were grand. I met and talked for a time with Gru Mononga. Gru is Congolese, and he's currently a student at Meadville Lombard oh. Theological School, our Unitarian Universalist Seminary in Chicago, the seminary from which I graduated. This year, He's attending virtually, which means he got to avoid the very cold Chicago winter, and he wasn't too disappointed. Mm -hmm. We talked about a theology professor, Dr. Michael Hogue, who has stretched both of our minds. He shared with me a notion, which I hope to explore with him more online, about the difference between Unitarianism in Africa and African Unitarianism. I also talked about permaculture with Celia Zua, a lay leader who had led the morning service. And I talked to Hans, whose last name I didn't get, about a dance for Desmond Tutu event coming up in the community the next weekend. This congregation in a country was has experienced much hardship, has found joy. They've learned to laugh and to cry more easily. They were fun and funny and so sweet to us. We stayed for nearly two hours. The Cape Town Unitarians list on their webpage the same seven principles and six sources as do the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association. They, too, place a flaming chalice in their midst as a symbol of their religious faith. They have chosen to use one that incorporates in its design the blossom of Protea, a unique, lovely, yet strong South African flower. They describe themselves as a spiritual community committed to honoring the inherent worth and dignity of every person. By the way, one of the differences between that community and congregations in the U.S. is the way they spell honor. They spell it H-O-N-O-U-R rather than H-O-N-O-R, as we would. Yet the core sentiment is a shared value, a value expressed here and there with enthusiasm, with joy, with love. The Cape Town Unitarian's mission statement reads, Inspired by our shared values and the collective wisdom of humanity, we come together as an open and inclusive community to grow in awareness 
understanding and insight, to nurture each other on our unique paths, to act towards a just and sustainable world. Or as expressed on the t-shirt Hans modeled for us, which unfortunately they did not have in my size. Mm -hmm. Cape Town Unitarians, justice, equality, sustainability, shared love and respect, liberal spirituality, accountability, open heart and mind. That certainly sounds like the aspirations of any Unitarian Universalist or Unitarian congregation anywhere on the globe. May we in our community continue with them to seek to joyfully manifest such values. May it be so. Mm.
us for that wonderful message. And Jeff, your music is extraordinary. Thank you very, very much for that as well. <clears throat> <sighs> well, we've come to the, almost the conclusion. Right now we move into our place of our offering. For those who are able, we ask that you consider a contribution, not only to this particular fellowship, but to our community partner, Saisla Outreach Services. Um, two great organizations, you know, we are self-regulated, if you will, or lay-led. Everything we do comes from the goodness of you and the contributions you make to this church, so we appreciate your gifts. Jeff's going to play some wonderful music, we're going to pass a basket around, and on one side you'll see SOS, on the other side you'll see the church here, Florence Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, so I ask that you contribute as you can. Uh, if the basket comes to you and you're not able to give, at least shower it with love before you pass it to the next person, okay? And if you will, before we begin, I ask that you repeat after me. Divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I give. All that I give. And all that I receive. All that I receive. I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. Bless and be. Thank you. So, Catherine, will you help on this side? And uh, Renee, would you help on this side? Sure. I'm going to ask our our new guest here to help out, and uh, Jeff's going to play some wonderful music. I'll walk you through the process. Okay. 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 All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll get that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Are you going to pass it around? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Tim Haley, and I've made a few modifications. We walk this earth but a brief moment in time. Amid the suffering and pain that is going on across the world from us, however great or small, let us continue to learn how to celebrate life. Yes, let us continue to grow in our capacity to love ourselves and the others. 
And let us continue to move toward the goal of a just world community. Let us send our renewed spirit of peace and hope to those suffering from this horrible conflict. Blessed be. Why don't we sing the peace song? <laughs> Jeff, did you want to say something before I to say anything about this? I think you said it well. I think uh, Jeff's going to put on some music here. He's going to join our circle. If you want to gather around the chairs, you're welcome to hold hands if you like. Not necessary. Uh, just be as comfortable as you possibly can be as we sing our peace song. The words are on the back of the program. If you want to hum along or just, I don't know, just be a part. However, you can. I think we'll do all of this at once. I'd rather hold hands. All set? All set. Let's get this started. Let's get the party going.